Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. All right, listeners, we are past the election. We are past all the social media uh, hate mail about daring to criticize or factually point out and play videos of Joe Biden's foreign policy record. Uh, Henry and I have uh, burned the secret MAGA hats that so many of you thought we had in our closet. So you can't prove it anymore just like the CIA can't be proved to have done waterboarding. Okay, we learn from the best and we're putting it into practice. But uh, all kidding aside, the election's through. We, we here on the pod and out in the streets and out in the movement are big proponents of the idea that nothing stops, right? The, uh, the fight for you know, reorienting foreign policy, bringing decency, empathy, and just humanity into what we do as a nation overseas and the way it boomerangs back home that doesn't change on november you know second third whatever day it was and there's a lot of work to be done our guests are going to kind of reflect that not it's business as usual over here in the fight and uh, we're just coming through veterans day uh we're recording on friday the 13th and so we're two days past what's become really like a week of Veterans Day, at least for those of us who are vets and somewhat public in, uh, you know, our pontification, because we, we get a lot of calls and appearances and it does feel like a week. Um, and staying in line with what's been a, a heck of a run of guests, I mean, really since uh, since the new year, but especially over the last uh, several months, uh, we are bringing on a Tom Dispatch regular who uh, I've followed for a long time. Henry's read his stuff for a long time. It's a weird world where you make your living digitally or you, you know, or you have your fun online digitally. And so you, you feel like, you know, all of these different kinds of folks and you don't know any of them in person. In fact, um, Bill, a story, William, a story, he was on a zoom call with me for full disclosure, the Eisenhower media network we've mentioned uh, he's one of our senior fellows. We, we had a meet and greet, you know, just last week. And uh, it was like kind of the first time you hear somebody's voice, really, or, or you see their face. And hopefully we'll do more of that in person. But uh, he's been writing with Tom Dispatch, which means, of course, that he's been writing, you know, for the nation and Salon and all the, the regular reposts for, for quite some time. And we're super glad to have him on. So uh, before I kind of jump into the usual uh, journey, life, love, liberty question, uh, I just want to let the listeners know a, a little bit about Bill and, you know, where he's coming from uh, on paper, right? You know, the bios that we can all pick up. So, you know, Bill was a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He was there for 20 years. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he retired in 05, which is, is interesting. And that's, that's the year I graduated uh, the academy. And so it's kind of funny how we, you know, he... <laughs> He left the business and uh, and I picked it up and boy, has it turned out great. So I, I think it was us who who had all these stellar victories, Bill. Uh, <laughs> but beyond, you know, beyond that, he, he, he's done a lot of stuff. OK, so professor of history, uh, he, he's written for Tom Dispatch, which means all over, but also Truth Out, History News Network, been at Alternet, uh, Antiwar.com, the usual. Uh, he's the author or the co-author of three books. Uh, Soldiers' Lives Through History, The Early Modern World, and that's 2007 with Dennis Showalter, who I've actually read a, a whole bunch over the years. Yeah, uh, Dennis Yeah, Dennis Showalter is a great guy and a uh, great military historian. And, and not to interrupt you, Danny, but um, unfortunately, we lost Dennis Showalter, uh, uh, I think, a few months ago. Uh, you know, he died natural causes. And 
uh, I just want to give him a, a shout out if I can. I, uh, I, he worked with me on that, on the Hindenburg book that I wrote and just, just a great guy. I'm really, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know that, but, uh, his work had been assigned at, I think West Point and the command and general staff college over the years. So even if you'd be on my own reading, I mean, he was, he was super respected and assigned across the board, which is, uh, yeah, really a great writer. So, uh, but, but yeah, you know, so he, and then he's, you know, so he did the Hindenburg book, uh, and also right on kind of a different topic, another book called observing God, Thomas Dick, uh, evangelicalism and popular science in Victorian Britain and America. And, uh, Bill, maybe we'll, we'll find a way to tie that stuff in because I love it when people have broad ranges of interest and scholarship, but, uh, you know, he's taught at the air force Academy, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, Pennsylvania College of Technology. You know, he's, he's got a doctor of philosophy. He's got a master's from John Hopkins and a whole bunch of experience in the military and a whole bunch more experience since then uh, doing what so many of us do, which is, you know, medically reading the news and trying to say something meaningful about it as best as possible. So, uh, Bill, thanks so much for coming on and thanks for letting me flatter you for a sec there. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Danny. You know, it's such a kind of cliche platitude hybrid to start interviews with, you know, tell us about you and your life. But I don't know, when we do it, I, I choose to believe it's not, <laughs> which is, you know, I'm an American male, which means that delusion is my birthright. So I, I can do that. But I, I do think that there's value in someone kind of describing their journey that's not on paper, right? The stuff that's not necessarily in the bio underneath the articles and what brought them to the military, what's brought them to the place they're at, both intellectually, ethically, professionally, or just personally. So yeah, Bill, just t tell us anything you want to tell us about how you got here. Hey, uh, thanks. Um, well, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I, when I look back growing up, I always had an interest in the military and especially the Air Force. Uh, you know, growing up in the 1970s, uh, I built a lot of models. I'm not sure how popular that is nowadays, but you remember all those models you could buy and, and make, you know, tanks, airplanes and the like. Well, I love to make model airplanes. I remember, uh, I remember one of them, uh, I, I built the uh, B-1 bomber uh, and then I, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and lived in a triple decker. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, you know, launched the B-1 off the third floor porch with a firecracker uh, and the plane blew up and I was very happy. Um, which doesn't sound very American. Uh, that was right around the time that, that Jimmy Carter uh, canceled the B-1. Uh, and I thought, oh, my God, uh, you know, a president that actually took on the military industrial complex. But, you know, lo and behold, when Ronald Reagan became president, uh, the B-1 was uh, resuscitated. Uh, and, uh, and it goes to show you that even when uh, a president cancels a major weapon system, uh, sometimes they come back, as uh, as Stephen King wrote in a short story. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, to take on the Pentagon and the military industrial complex, uh, as you well know. But but I digress. I, you know, I just I just always been interested in the military. I I joined up through ROTC. Uh, I went to uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And I got my degree in engineering, and and I went into the Air Force in uh, 1985. And my first assignment was to uh, Air Force Space Command in Cheyenne Mountain, uh, and that was that was really uh, eye-opening. I've I've written about that for the nation and for Tom Dispatch. Uh, leaving Cheyenne Mountain uh, was the title of the article, and you know because that was you know I we would I would I would go inside the mountain under 2,000 feet of uh, solid granite. You know that was our nuclear uh, you know, our, our sort of, uh, our, our mind shaft, if you will, <laughs> if, if everyone remembers uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, it was, it was a safe place to be of so a nuclear war, or at least we thought it was in the 1960s when Cheyenne mountain was built. And then the uh, Soviet ICBMs became more accurate. Uh, and Cheyenne mountain probably would have been among the first targets if, if we ever came to a nuclear exchange, but fortunately that did not happen. Uh, so I started as an engineer, but then the Air Force Academy decided that they wanted 
to sponsor an engineer to get a master's degree in the history of science and technology. And I was the guy who was picked. Uh, so I went off and got my master's at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then after teaching at the Air Force Academy in the history department for two years, uh, the academy uh, had, that I didn't even know, but they had a exchange program with Oxford. Uh, and I competed for that and was picked. And so they sent me to Oxford to get my, uh, my doctorate. And, and I taught some more at the Air Force Academy, had some other assignments. And, and my last assignment before I retired uh, was the uh, Associate Provost and Dean of Students at the Defense Language Institute a foreign language center and, and at the Presidio of Monterey. Uh, and that in a way was an eye-opening assignment because we were, you know, this is right after 9-11 and we were standing up a lot of, we standed, we stood up uh, or created as, uh, as civilians would say, but you know how we in the military, we talk about standing up, uh, you know, we stood up a new uh, school for Arabic language training. We had a, a OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom uh, Task Force, uh, you know, we, we're creating all these new training programs in languages like Pashto and Dari. Uh, and all of this was for the GWAT, you know, the global war on terror. So that was a, that was a very interesting assignment at the end of my career, you know, being involved in, in trying to, uh, to help out the troops who are being sent, you know, because as you know, Danny, better than I do, uh, seeing combat, uh, our troops were at a big disadvantage, just like they were in Vietnam. You know, you, we send them to Afghanistan and Iraq, wherever they can't speak the language. And so you can't speak the language. All you do is end up shouting at people uh, in English or you end up pointing guns at them and uh, otherwise assaulting them verbally and sometimes physically. Uh, and being able to speak the language uh, in a so-called, you know, coin or counterinsurgency is absolutely essential. And yet we were always at the Presidio of Monterey, we were always at the very end of the, of the army's food chain and could you know, barely get funding. I remember one time we, uh, General, uh, I think it was General Abizade who visited, uh, and that was a big deal because that was like, uh, hey, you know, hey, the Presidio of Monterey is actually on the army's radar uh, as, as an important place. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going on and on, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. Bill, did you say that you got to start your career in Colorado Springs and end it in Monterey? That's right. I mean, I don't know what you're complaining about on Tom Dispatch all the time. I mean, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how you bookended the career. Uh, my first duty station, you know, after the base, of course, was also Fort Carson. So I know oh, right. Cheyenne Mountain, you know, and all that was kind of like the front view out of the my house, you know, there's a Pikes Peak yeah. and all that. It was a super interesting and fascinating town i always tell people it's more of an air force town despite the big army base just because there's so what is there four different yeah. air force sort of installations in the area yeah not 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 to bore people but you have peterson air force base you have shriver uh which is the which is probably under the space force now i'm not sure about that uh of course you have the air force academy uh and of course cheyenne mountain which I think was mothballed, but maybe reactivated again. Again, I'm, I'm now, you know, since I've been retired 15 years, I'm, you know, some of my knowledge has expired, so to speak. No, I mean, I, I think I heard that as well. And it's funny how fast you can find yourself sort of falling, <laughs> falling out of the, uh, the up-to-date knowledge. Some of my buddies who are still in will correct my acronyms and such uh, in an article to say, oh, we don't call it that anymore. And then I always say, but it's the same thing, right? You know? Right. I wanted to ask you about Abizade real quick. Um, so he came to visit when you were at Monterey. And I mean, I don't know, at, you know, at what level there, you were privy to what his thoughts were on things. But, you know, there was this moment so at, at, right at that point in the end of your career. And when I was just coming in where Abizade was seen as one of the more, you know, sort of like ur urbane and intellectual types. I mean, he had spent time in Lebanon. I mean, he you know, he, he had spoken the language, I believe, or at least um, ha had done some duty over there. He was, you know, he was kind of thought of as a more internationalist officer as far as the army goes. And I was wondering if, you know, you had any, you know, sort of interaction with him or thoughts on how he viewed not only DLI, but also just 
in general, what you had made of him at the time? Yeah, well, on, uh, you know, by, by coming to DLI, he was definitely making a statement about the importance of, of, of uh, foreign language training. But unfortunately, uh, his visit was, was kind of hush-hush. Uh, and when he came, I think he was, I think he was hosted by, you know, the commandant and, and the army. And, and I, I believe it or not, I only heard about the visit after he had already gone. So maybe they were keeping the, the air force guy out. Uh, you know, it might be an army thing to do, but no, I, you know, I think, I think I was a, you know, had some good ideas. I, I, you know, I think he, he was an improvement that Sanchez, uh, Ricardo Sanchez was either right, one. Right. Yeah. Uh, he was definitely an improvement, uh, or, you know, uh, over 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 Sanchez. But uh, but you know, the Iraq, the the whole Iraq situation became so messy uh, so quickly, uh, and and obviously, again, uh, you have you have the experience. Well, you know, well, you know, I was thinking today about you know when I was writing Tom Dispatch articles, you know, saying that we needed to you know, get out of Iraq or Afghanistan and criticizing the war effort. It was guys like you who are over there fighting the war effort that I was now writing against uh, and, and trying to, in a way, trying to make sure that guys like you weren't sent over there. And you can see how well I succeeded. Well, you know, I know that Camus has kind of become the cliche in the midst of a pandemic, right? But you know, the, the struggle itself, right? The struggle itself is enough to warm a man's heart. It, you were in the rare group that actually cared to do it, especially from the military perspective, you know, from within the military ranks or the retired military ranks. But it is interesting to think about that. Um, someone else we both, you know, know of and, and know to some extent, uh, Andy Basevich, yes. you know, I may have known for example, that his son was killed before he did. I, I don't know. Um, I, w- I basically was able to figure out, you know, and I didn't know him at the time, but I had read his book, actually, uh, The New American Militarism, right? Because he was writing about the war, you know, even really just before you, right? Just before you retired, he was really making right. a splash um, to some extent. And uh, so anyway, I was able to figure out through, you know, we do the, the battle roster numbers or whatever, and you see the different units and I was able to figure out the name or whatever. And I figured that's not that common of a, of a name. Right. And figured, oh man, that's, that's probably, you know, his son or his nephew, you know, I didn't really know much about base which is personal life at that time, but it is interesting to think about where we all were, you know, kind of a, where are they now and where were they then uh, about <laughs> that period. And it's interesting talking about Abaze because some of those generals, I think, and how they viewed things and what they uh, what they thought, what they said have been lost. Like a lot of that history, it feels like ancient history. For example, the Iraq surge or even the Afghan surge feel like ancient history, but they really weren't that long ago. And before Petraeus comes in and largely through kind of self-styling, right, and, you know, his whole thing of just unapologetic, like ego boosting and, you know, reputation building, but I mean, right. he sort of whitewashed everybody before him and said, nobody else got it, right? And I'm going to fix it all. And, and, and people bought that for a long time. And to some extent, the neoliberal sort of think tank crowd still thinks that, right? They still hold him up. But Abze was actually exactly. saying, uh, wasn't Abze? I mean, Abze was saying, look, don't surge, right? We need to start transitioning. And that's interesting because that's totally forgotten. And, and it's also, they, they made him out to sound like boneheads. But Abze probably knew more about the region than any of the other generals on the staff at the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I, I honestly, I, I don't, I don't know it. I don't know the situation that well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, th- the whole thing, the whole thing with Petraeus is how I, I started writing for Tom Dispatch to begin with, because that was my first article in, in 2007, you know, when things were really going bad uh, in Iraq. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, the general Petraeus is, is, is kind of a, uh, uh, announced as 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 King David as as the savior of the situation in Iraq for for the Bush Cheney administration, uh, and and you know so I I saw him giving you know testimony you know before the before Congress you know basically saying you know this is how it, it you know think a little bit back to William Westmoreland you know appearing before Congress 
you know, and, and, and con con congressional committees and basically, you know, with, with those, uh, those various, um, you know, metrics, uh, like, like body count, you know, explaining, you know, this is how we're going to, to win. Uh, and, you know, just as, just as LBJ uh, Johnson was hiding behind the B metal chest and, and manly visage of, uh, of William Westmoreland, I mean, Bush Cheney ended up hiding behind Petraeus and it just really offended me as a, as a retired military officer that I, I saw Bush Cheney as abdicating their responsibility. You know, they're the ones who are supposed to explain as the civilian leaders of the commander in chief. I saw it as, as their responsibility, but here they are, you know, giving us, giving us general Petraeus and, and, and basically in a way, you know, was was peddling, you know, convenient lies. Uh, I guess instead of the inconvenient truth of <laughs> Al Gore, you know, the the convenient lies of David Petraeus that that, that we can win this thing. Uh, although he always couched it in terms, and you'll recall this, the progress was always fragile and reversible. He always used those terms, right? Right. Uh, and and so. Is you know, of course, as you know, but you know, Petraeus's background, he had been in charge of of training uh the, the Iraqi military. Uh like a couple years before he became the overall, you know, commander there, CENTCOM, whatever. Uh, and he had not done well at that job. Uh and of course, the Iraqi military, you know, the training was always pretty much a disaster, as we discovered, you know, when that military collapsed. Uh you know, under assault and what was that 2013. Um, and so, and, and so Petraeus is so, so much of, of, of what he accomplished was, well, you know, he was right. It was definitely fragile and reversible as, as events proved. It's so interesting the way guys like that tend to rise. And I'm sure that you saw it even, you know, in the Air Force just as well. It's, you know, there are good people who rise. I mean, I, I really do try not to just do hyperbole, right, or just do generalization. But to a large extent, it's, a, it's remarkable the sorts of people who end up in many of those positions. And Petraeus was a particularly unique uh, self-promoter. And one of the ways he did that, it seems, well, two of the ways that I noticed, well, one that you mentioned is he's very cautious, about his language, always kind of having an out for himself, saying a lot without saying anything uh, right. in many cases. And then he also made decisions throughout his career, you know, from, I, I don't know, he probably loves her and everything, but, you know, a lot of people looked at it from the start and said, geez, the guy married the superintendent's daughter after he graduated West Point. But beyond that, he's actually worked pretty hard and he still does to whitewash inconvenient past, you know, almost like uh, something in one of these, you know, uh, you know, uh, Orson Welles type, you know, old films, right? Like the, the skeletons that get shoved into the closet and the whitewashing failure throughout. It's, you know, did you find in your career that certain types of officers tended to, to rise and, and whether or not how you viewed the, the archetypes to the extent that there were any? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you know, I, I've kind of, I, I've written about this. I, I think, and, and and you know this yourself. There is there is uh, when you look at officers, as, especially the flag officers, generals and admirals, uh, those officers identified fairly early in their careers, uh, and and they're they're sort of mentored. Uh, they're they're given certain choice assignments. Uh, they're 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 carefully watched and in a way groomed for for stars uh and i i didn't even you know i hey i retired as lieutenant colonel i didn't have a lot of exposure to uh, general officers uh you know i met some good ones uh and and you know there there are others though who you know obviously won promotion because they were i i, I like to say they're they're true believers you know they 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 believe in 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 their particular service branch, uh, they they put loyalty to to their bosses uh, and and to the service above. I would say they put it above loyalty to the to the Constitution, 
or or they really don't see the difference between the two. Uh, and, and I think that's very dangerous, obviously. They have their interests become narrow and parochial uh, and they lose sight of the, the, the real purpose of, of, of being in, in, in the military, which is again, as you know, we're always, every time we're promoted, uh, we, we, we swear the oath of office again. And so, and we know that's all about supporting and defending the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, it's, 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 it's about the constitution. It's about our freedoms and, and liberties and, and protecting our democracy. That's, that's why we serve. You know, I, I, I think it's interesting what you raised there because when you say, when you say things like that, that I, that I agree with and that I say constantly, you know, about the rise, I, I find that you, I, I, at least I tend to get two pushbacks and one of them is what do you know, what do you know you could make it? right kind of thing like yo you didn't make it past major you didn't make it past lieutenant well, colonel so hey, you're sour okay. grapes you know and I'll, then yeah go ahead no uh, yeah that's true i i would not have made general uh i would not i i would not have made flag rank myself um i i may have been able to reach the rank of of full colonel possibly you know i was i was i was an engineer I, I was not a pilot, you know, being, being in the air force, you know, obviously it helps if, if you're a pilot or what's called a rated officer, you know, you have wings, it gives you an, an advantage in promotion, but, but, you know, the air force promotes a lot of other officers, you know, to general rank, uh, other than pilots. But I was, I was happy to be honest. I was, I was happy serving for 20 years. I, I reached the rank that I wanted to, to reach. Uh, you know, I made all my normal promotions, hit all my gates, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and after 20 years, uh, I was, um, I'd had enough to be honest. And, and my wife and I, you know, we were tired of moving every two or three years. And, and even though, as you said, uh, my, you know, most of my assignments weren't really weren't that bad. Uh, you know, I wasn't in uh, Fallujah or, uh, Kandahar, you know, I was in Monterey and, and uh, in Colorado Springs, but even so, you get tired of moving. Uh, and so, you know, yeah. Uh, no, it's just like you. I, I would, I would love to see a Brigadier General Danny. Uh, and but you know, I know your career, and I know that you had the integrity to speak out. Uh, and and your career ended as as a major, you know, because you chose. Uh, a path of, uh, I, I would, I would, a, a much more difficult path. And I, I'd go so far as to say a courageous path uh, in the sense that you were speaking out before you were tired. Whereas, whereas uh, I, I really didn't start speaking out until after I retired. Uh, and so all credit to you, not that you need me singing your praises, but seriously, uh, I was very impressed. Uh, I remember when I remember when Tom Englehart said, hey, I got a new guy, you know, he's going to be writing for Tom Dispatch. He's a he's still a serving army major. And I think the first thing I said to Tom was, I said, I, I hope he's careful because, you know, I'm retired. So so I, I'm a, it's a little safer for me to speak out. It's not as easy when you're still in the military to speak out. So I'm sure you've talked a lot about it, but it must have been difficult for you. You must have felt like people were ostracizing you or stepping away from you or keeping their distance. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, no, I mean, obviously I appreciate that. And it's a funny thing about it. I think people like us who at least try to live, you know, try to live our values. And I think tries the key word for all of us, right. I'm littered with hypocrisy um, is that we have a tendency. We always feel like we're, we're not doing enough. You know, it's, uh, sometimes I'll be talking to, you know, some of like the serious whistleblowers, even in the EMN crowd, right. You know, among our senior fellows. And I'm like, geez, I did nothing, you know, when I was on, on active duty compared to these people. Um, and of course I was teasing about the uh, assignments and everything. And when I was bringing up with you, you know, that, um, that often people will say like, you couldn't make it. Obviously that's not my view of you or, or even myself to a certain extent, although I had my own limitations that were mostly mental health oriented, frankly, but that probably would have held me back anyway. 
but it's interesting how that's one angle that they go to. And then the second angle that they go to, and then I'll just circle back to what you were just saying, but the other angle they often go to is, Oh, like you're, you're overgeneralizing, you know, these people can't all just care about their careers. And one of the things that I often try to plug in there is I say, no, no, it's very important to understand that. I think a lot of them make this uh, deal with themselves in their head where they say, look, I might have to make some compromises, but, uh, it's worth it because it's better that, you know, I'm in charge because I'm principled and I mean well. And so I've got to do what I've got to do to get to the top so I can make changes within the inside. Right. And, and I believe that for a long time, even at my lower and mid level. Um, and I let people convince me of it. And, you know, I had bosses who I did respect who would say, no, you've got to stay right. You've got to stay. Right. Uh, last point on that though. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm <laughs> obviously I'm the interview and not the interviewee, but this is forced on a hill <laughs> where we just say whatever the heck we want. Uh, you know, it's funny when I started writing for Tom, I had zero, you know, I had zero fucks left to give, frankly. Uh, uh, and so in many ways, I, I, I was like the serial killer that wants to get caught. Maybe. I don't know. But it, but actually what was interesting about it was how long before anyone really noticed, you know, and I think it's partly because alternative, you know, alternative media, even fairly prominent alternative media like Tom Dispatch you can actually stay under the radar for a while. I had already written and published the book on active duty before I ever emailed Tom and nobody really noticed, but they did have a book signing at the West Point bookstore in my building where I was teaching and nobody got mad. You know, there's one Colonel who yelled at me, but it was like nothing. So it was interesting how that worked, but then you're right though. Once it was public, once someone complained and it only takes one like 06 or something, you know, to call IG, uh, it gets ugly, of course. And I think what you noted is important because uh, you may have seen it at the very end or even in retirement, I, I imagine, but most of the pressure isn't overt or legal. It's like, you know, suddenly you're a little bit of a black sheep, right? Suddenly people keep their distance and they warn you and they, you know, it's funny how a lot of it is like a social ostracization as much as anything else. I mean, I had my friends who were my, my boys regardless, you know, and I wasn't worried about that but the the polite you know cocktail party circled so to speak uh within the military definitely gets kind of ugly right right yeah i mean maybe in a way it was i mean i suppose it was easier for me in the sense that you know I, after leaving the military and instead of you know say going to the washington beltway and and getting some kind of consultant job or going to work for lockheed martin or general dynamics or whatever you know i got an academic job i I, I taught history at the Pennsylvania College of Technology. It's kind of in a rural area in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is probably best known as the host of the Little League World Series. Uh, yes, yes. It, yeah. So, you know, I was kind of in, in obscurity and, and, you know, there, was, I, there were no military bases around me. Uh, my, you know, my, my new friends were, were you know, acquaintances, were were academics for the most part. And, and so, you know, there wasn't the sense that, oh my God, if, if I start writing critical stuff, you know, what's, what's my employer going to say, you know, what's, what's my think tank going to say, what's my, you know, what's my military contractor going to say? Uh, so I didn't have that kind of fear, but, but I do remember, you know, even before my first article for Tom Dispatch, I actually emailed my, my, my Dean and said, Hey, I, you know, I have an article coming out, you know, it's a little bit critical of the military. Uh, you just, just in case, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, it's like, remember the chain of command. Um, you don't want, you, you never want to blindside your boss. So, and in, in, in my case, my, 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 my Dean was actually, had actually been in the CIA uh, and, and had some army experience as well. So, so, you know, he, he wasn't phased at all by this. Uh, but yeah, I don't see like if, if you take one of these jobs, at, you know, in the Beltway as part of the military industrial complex, you know, it almost goes without saying that you really you really can't speak out like like we do or you'll you'll quickly find that your contract is not renewed. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting and I think I would. Uh... I would take not only being able to look myself in the mirror, but also not to have to worry about who I ask before I do what I do, especially since I can hardly hold my tongue. Uh, I think that would be difficult, but, you know, uh, pivoting, you know, a bit, um, 
we just came through Veterans Day and it sounds like a, a totally off base transition, but I, I wonder sometimes if it really is, you know, because and I'm going to let Henry kind of, you know, handle this portion. He's got some interesting thoughts here, but as we talk about the senior generals and uh, some of the self-promotion and stuff like that, uh, there's a part of me that wonders about, you know, societal, you know, overadulation and how that maybe affects all of us uh, as we move forward. But anyway, Henry, jump in. That was just my little plug that was in my head. Oh, that's all good. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. We can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone, anyone whom you might think would be affected by it. Young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for minorities and inflicts on minorities across the globe, and anyone else you think it might affect, please take a moment and share this with them. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P., Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Jason, Zach H., Ren Jacob, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. So Bill, I, uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed your, uh, your blog post for, uh, for Veterans Day. Your, your detailed family history of, of military service reminded me a, a, a bit of my own family. Um, what I wanted to talk about is that, you know, most Americans' impressions of war and how it impacts society, they, they never really leave the confines of a Fourth of July parade or a 10-episode miniseries produced by Tom Hanks. But this, you know, confined storytelling has a real cost, one that Veterans Day and even the term veteran demonstrate uh, through their sanitized remembrance, quote unquote, thank you for your service. Um, for for my part, has morphed into, tell me about your service, and I I think that that should be right. So it's a a much better, easier standard for any profession that can easily fall into the hero worship category. But ideas like veteran worship, uh, excuse me, veteran worship about the the premise of the thin blue line. Show us how hard it can be for veterans or for public servants in general with hero complexes to reach past all that notional support and see a more realistic view of whatever their service happens to be. Now, you've written at uh, Tom Dispatch about how the American hero worship machine these days covers soldiers, cops, firemen, doctors, to name a few professions. Um where we're told to, to simply worship, not, not have questions, not study things for ourselves, not take stock of the umbrella of death and damage that comes with it, 
Um, the moment people remember without really remembering is the moment when uh, unvarnished views are required. Um, I have a quote here from uh, The History Boys by Alan Bennett. Uh, quote, it's not less we forget, it's less we remember. That's what this is all about. The memorials, the cenotaph, the two minutes of silence, because there is no better way of forgetting something than by commemorating it. So, as, Bill, I was wondering if you would tell the listeners a bit about your own family's military experience and um, how, how you feel that led into your own, and also how you choose to remember their uh, service and sacrifice. Right. Uh, yeah, my, my family's... Uh, I don't come from a strongly, uh, uh, you know, like a real st strong tradition of military service, but... But my, um, you know, my, my father and his two brothers were, were all drafted uh, World War II. Uh, in my, my father served in, in, in the army in, a, in an armored unit. Uh, and uh, one of my uncles served in, in, in the Marine Corps. Uh, my, uh, my uncle, Freddie, on my mother's side, he, he was actually at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Uh, he was in the army and, and they sent him to Guadalcanal. Um, and that was one of the most bitter island campaigns of, of World War II where, where he won the, uh, the bronze star, uh, but uh, as, a, as an enlisted man. But, you know, I never really got to know my uncle Freddie because, uh, you know, he had got malaria, uh, which is most of the guys got malaria fighting in the Pacific and places like Guadalcanal uh, and the malaria and, and probably probably PTSD from, from that combat, uh, led to a shortened life. So by the time I came along, uh, years after that, and I really don't remember my uncle Freddie at all. Uh, my, my brother enlisted in, in the air force, uh, right after the Vietnam war. And I got another brother-in-law who, uh, who actually was drafted to Vietnam and, and served as a, as a radio operator, um, as uh, for an for an artillery unit, so um, I had that background in in my uh, and and in my family, which is probably why I decided uh, when I was uh, seventeen, eighteen, uh, that and the fact that my father said that uh, that he wasn't going to pay my, for my college education. <laughs> so uh, I said, "Okay, Dad, uh, I want to go to a fairly pricey uh, private engineering school." Uh, I think I'll pursue an Air Force ROTC scholarship. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. And that's how I, I came to be uh, in the Air Force. But that family military tradition uh, pointed me in the direction of serving uh, in the military. And, and it made sense to me at the time because we were involved in, in what I saw as, as the Cold War, right? A, a cataclysm, potentially cataclysmic struggle between ourselves and the Soviet Union. And it really seemed as if uh, we, you know, we, we needed a, a strong military to, 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 uh, to keep the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact at, at bay. Uh, and it, seemed, it, it also seemed in 1985, when I entered the military, that you know, the Soviet Union would be around forever. Uh, and certainly our intelligence agencies thought that way. Uh, and, and yet four years later, you know, the Berlin Wall is falling. And by 1991, the Soviet Union is collapsing. So, I mean, that's one thing we need to keep in mind is, you know, some of the verities, some of the things we take for granted today, uh, I took for granted in 1985, like virtually everyone else in the military, that we'd always face this, this Soviet threat, a peer threat. Uh, and yet the Soviet Union collapsed six years later. Uh, and I think we, there's a lesson to be learned there. Uh, and, you know, those people who think that Russia today is somehow a threat, like the Soviet Union was in the 1980s, you know, they should all have their heads examined. Uh, it's nothing like that at all. Uh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really shocked in a way that we're, we're witnessing a sort of new Cold War uh, where China and, and, or, the, and or Russia uh, are being held up again as 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 threats when they when they really aren't, or at least they're not threats in the way that that they were when I entered the military in 1985. With respect to hero worship, 
you know, I, I've written on this and, and, and my sense is that, you know, you, you talk to people in the military, like you talk to, I talk to Lamar about Vietnam. <laughs> he laughs at that hero stuff. You know, he's there, we, you know, we weren't heroes. I, I wasn't a hero in Vietnam. He's just doing his job uh, as an enlisted guy in the army. Uh, same with my dad, same with everyone I've talked to. Uh, I'm sure it's the same with Danny. Uh, I haven't asked Danny this, but, but, you know, Danny's in combat, you know, he lost men under his command. I think, you know, if somebody came up to Danny and said, Hey, well, Hey, thanks hero. I think Danny, not to put words in Danny's mouth. I, I think he'd say, Hey, look, most veterans will say, number one, I'm not a hero. And number two, the heroes are the ones we leave behind. Uh, and it's, and we, and we do, we, we, we do the real heroes a disservice by, by, by throwing that word around, you know, so loosely. Uh, I am definitely not a hero uh, because the heroes in our lives are, are very rare people indeed. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, speak for yourself, Bill. I mean, I, I actually personally on Veterans Day now, I wear a shirt that says you're welcome for my service everywhere I go. It's uh, because that's how I feel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I 100% agree with you. It, and I, I even make that dark joke because I do think that there is a seeping sense among some, not even maybe most veterans, that they've started to believe their own mythology that in many cases has been pushed upon them. That like, you know, everybody's a hero. Biden has to end his speeches by saying, God bless our troops. You know, it's become like a verbal tick. And it's just this, this it's almost like a fetishization. I think the problem with, you know, too much of that positive reinforcement is that you can start to believe some of this nonsense, you know, no, and, and I think that's not the, the instinct isn't that, I mean, most guys that I served with uh, feel exactly the way you do. Right. You know, and, and they would say the same thing, like, no, my buddies that didn't come home are our heroes or, or even among them, it's a small number that were actually heroes, according to like the, the, the clear, you know, the clear definition, but it's, but there is some of this that's, that's going on. And, you know, I remember my grandmother, when, when I got accepted to West Point, it was, you know, in my little world, it was a big deal. You know, there hadn't been a lot of college and even the extended family. And so like, you know, West Point was considered like a big deal. And my grandfathers who'd been in World War II thought this was like, how could our like, you know, enlisted selves create a grandson who could get into the academy? I thought you right. had to like know a congressman. Uh, and everybody was just adulating. I mean, I was just the golden child, as my sister calls it to this day. And my grandmother, who was just this brilliant little tiny woman who would have been like an English professor in another generation, you know, but never even learned to drive a car, or really had a job. Brilliant woman. And she just like called me over and she said, you know, sit next to me. And I went over there and she said, don't get a big head. You're not that special. And like that was, and she adored me. But I mean, I think about that and I say, man, like, we all need that in our lives a little more. And I think sometimes what you're describing uh, does get lost when there's too much public adulation or private, you know? Right. I totally agree. So um, uh, before we go on, Bill, my, uh, and you mentioned it about your uncle, Freddie, my grandpa Ray uh, survived Pearl Harbor. Um, he was a, he was a Marine on the USS Tennessee and uh, he turned a turned a fire hose onto an on onto a an electrical conduit or cabinet that was on fire, and it shot him across the room. And oh wow! He, yeah, he 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 came out of it rel relatively scot free. Um, I mean, he did have some injuries and was was held up for a while, but I don't think there was any lingering uh, any lingering is issues from specifically that day. But he went on to fight in in the Marshals, and then uh, also served in Korea. Um and uh, fought at the Chosen Reservoir. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> and, so, and that's and that's some of my my family history. Is I have uh, I, b I believe most of my family have been volunteers, but that it goes back quite a ways. And it's it definitely the the mythos of that you know looms large for me in in some certain ways. Right. Um, I wanted to pick out something from a, a recent piece of, uh, going on along in the same lines with with hero worship. Um, you had mentioned that U.S. military personnel are supposed to defend the Constitution, not wage wars or count lives taken as successes. 
how do you think we can move towards that notion? You know, how do you think we can change or advocate for an ideal of remembrance that works towards legitimately honoring that notion um, that it can be truly about upholding the ideal more than the people that are supposed to uphold it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, uh, I think, I think we as, as a country have to remember why we have a military to begin with. Uh, I, I think partly, uh, we need to, well, you know, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about this. Uh, I've written a lot about, you know, the citizen soldier tradition. And, and that's what I'd like to see the United States get back to, you know, nowadays we have this notion that, and, and the military encourages this, this whole idea that, you know, we all need to be warriors and, and war fighters. Uh, and in a way uh, it, the idea is, is that, is that we only exist to, to fight wars, which is nonsensical. If, if, if you're, if you're in a democracy, you know, James Madison said that, uh, uh, that, you know, constant warfare is, is the, is the enemy of, of democracy because constant warfare just e erodes away at, at democratic underpinnings. Constant warfare reinforces this idea that you need a, a unitary executive. Uh, so, uh, you know, and rather ha rather than having Congress declare war, you know, basically presidents send the troops on on what I would say is wars of choice. That that I think, if we were really honest, we would we would have to say they are unconstitutional. So somehow we we need to get back. We we need to throw away this whole idea of of you know the troops being war fighters and and warriors get back to this notion of the citizen soldier. We need to get back to the notion of, of service. There's, there's a lot more to being, a, a, you know, a service member uh, than, than, than fighting wars and, you know, being GI Joe uh, and, you know, mastering your, mastering your weapon, you know, that kind of narrow minded idea of, of what it means to be a soldier. And again, it, it comes back to the, the the oath of office. I I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it's 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 we we seem to have as a country we've sort of lost our our center, so to speak. Oh, that, that absolutely answers it. Um, yeah, we 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 have gotten to way too attached to to slogans. To this is very linear remembrance of of what has happened and what uh what needs to be focused on um you know and i i think that they you know the media just kind of you know if it that that whole mentality of if if, if it bleeds it leads they just push that so far to the front that ordinary people are who who say that they they can't you know that they can't understand military experience they really can but but i i understand the the assumption um Daniel Ospitry, I thought there. Why don't you go ahead and jump in? Yeah. Well, you know, this. I think some of this relates, actually, believe it or not. It kind of worked out to your latest Tom Dispatch piece, which was uh, reclaiming American idealism. We could use a leader like George McGovern again. Um, I am. I liked this article a lot for a number of reasons, um, partly because I'm kind of a, a George McGovern groupie, which... Uh, <laughs> Bill, we might be the only two left, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but really, you know, I, I had written an article, I think for truth, Dig maybe like three years ago called something like, where have you gone, George McGovern, you know, and, uh, and I'm a bit of an old soul and, and a romantic sort of idealist type uh, on Halloween, you know, uh, as sort of a joke, I, I, I have like a cut off George McGovern campaign shirt. I collect these like old fashioned campaign shirts because I'm a geek, but I only like Democrats who lost. That's kind of my niche market, you know, so <laughs> I got like a Mondale, you know, but McGovern's my favorite. It's like a peace symbol, you know, with the American flag inside the fingers and it says McGovern 72. And, uh, you know, I had like 
I had my son take a picture of me on Halloween. I said, Oh, it's Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. You know, bring out, you know, break out your, break out your fantasy costumes. Mine is a uh, actual anti-war Democrat, you know? <laughs> and of course I got some, I got some messages saying like, Oh, this is right before the election. Are you trying to get Trump elected? And I was like, I gotta be able to make jokes guys, you know, but it wasn't even really a joke. So I, what I think was interesting and it connects though, is you say at one point, you know, like in the, uh, around the second page, you know, uh, you say that like so many combat veterans of the greatest generation, McGovern never bragged about his wartime exploits. Uh, and then you go on to basically describe why we need to broach even the conversation, the radical act, as, a, as I've been kind of calling it. And you inspired me to talk about this, actually, in our EMN fellows meeting, the, the radical act of even saying the word peace. So I don't know, maybe you could just give us an idea of of, of your interest in, in George McGovern, uh, how his military service played in and, and what you think we can kind of learn from him, you know? Right. I, you know, I, I just, I, I wish, I wish I'd actually been able to talk to George McGovern a little bit more because I met him. Uh, I met him in 1990 uh, at the air force Academy. We had a, a military history symposium on the Vietnam war. And, and he came, he came to the air force Academy to participate in that. Uh, and I was sent. I was, sent, I, was I was an errand boy, uh, and it makes me think of apocalypse now. But uh, anyway, I was an errand boy, uh, sent to the library to chase down a book for him, and and I did meet him briefly, uh, and maybe shook his hand. I, I'm a little I'm a little iffy on my on my uh, memory, but but um, as I as I said in the article, I may not have known at the time, or I didn't fully grasp that. You know, I, that, that he had a distinguished war record in World War II, that, that he had flown, you know, 35, mission, 35 missions in a B-24 bomber, that he had won the Distinguished Flying Cross for, for landing uh, that bomber, which had been uh, heavily damaged and, and saving the lives of his crew. Uh, and yet he never, to my knowledge, he never made a big to-do about his military service, his bravery, the fact that he was decorated. I mean, you, can you imagine that nowadays? I mean, you had someone like Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who was, I think, in the Naval Reserve, who served for a few months as a, as a driver to a general in Afghanistan. And all you heard Mayor Pete say was about how he was a military veteran. Uh, and how he was, I even, I think I saw on his website that he even d d described himself as a decorated military veteran. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, <laughs> you know, how can you compare someone like Mayor Pete to, to a real combat hero like, uh, like George McGovern? And yet McGovern is remembered today by a lot of people as like, oh, he's that peacenik guy. He's that loser who lost to Nixon. And, and yet, you know, I think it was precisely because McGovern had seen what war was like, seen war up close, had experienced the horrors and dangers. That was part of why he was so firmly committed to peace. Uh, you know, it, it's easy for someone like Nixon, who played poker, you know, during World War II, and, and apparently made so much money playing poker that he funneled it into his first political campaign uh, in California. Um, it's easy for someone like Nixon to, you know, to bomb the Vietnamese in 1972, you know, with B-52s. I don't think that would have been an easy thing for George McGovern to do because he knew what bombing was about. I don't think he would have done it. Uh, and we need to get back to this idea that that you know, peace, peace should be our normal. Peace should be normal for democracy, not war. War should not be our normal. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but, but you know, we've now, or, you know, since 9-11, people say, since 2001, and, and that means that, that if you're a teenager, if you're up to the age of 18, 19, You've never known a United States. You've never known a country when it's been at peace because allegedly we've always been at war. So what, what does that teach our, our young people? It, it teaches them that war is our normal and that peace is some fantasy. It's like, uh, you know, 
uh, smoking dope and listening to John Lennon sing Imagine, you know, but, but peace, but peace can't be what we aim for. Right. I, it's like, no, peace, peace should be our normal. And I think McGovern got that. Uh, and that's why, you know, people laughed at Dennis, Dennis Kucinich when he talked about, you know, was it 2008 that he's saying, you know, we needed the department of peace. And it's like, Oh my God, a department of peace. He's crazy. Right. It's like, why is that crazy? Why, why aren't we working for peace? Uh, and the other part of that is I say, you know, we need to work toward peace because, and, and I emphasize work because peace is not easy. You know, again, people are sort of like, well, peace, you're, you're, you know, that's, that's like, you know, human beings are, you know, we're, uh, we're violent animals and you, you can't have peace is that the world is, you know, competitive and the killing and all that. And it's like, yeah, you know, there is that obviously history shows us that, you know, I've studied military history. I've taught military history. Uh, history teaches us that, that wars happen, but, but history also shows times of, of peace. Uh, and we should be working a lot harder toward peace than we, than we currently are. It's interesting how you mentioned that it's in some ways the, the horror that McGovern had seen, right. And, and, you know, just, been a part of like any of us who've been in war and uh, probably the way that affected his principles. But I would wonder also in a way, the way it built his confidence in himself where, you know, he was, he was a, here is a candidate who was confident enough that when a geek like me 50 years later, you know, almost goes back and uh, starts collecting his, you know, buttons and shirts from the time, I mean, they had like peace symbols on them. And there was a famous one that said like George McGovern for peace. And he's like letting go of a dove. Um, and, and, and it's funny because, you know, Democrats, especially today, wouldn't really try that, you know, in the mainstream establishment. You oh, know, no they're, they're so scared of the word dove. I've always said the Democrat dilemma is this idea that they feel they have to tack right in order to like burnish their tough guy. You know, yep. do, do you I, that just really struck me about what you were saying that, you know, I never totally thought of it that way, but it's like, sometimes the personal is political beyond the platitude there. Like right. the fact that he was this principled guy who probably was fairly confident in himself and understood with humility, what he was and what he wasn't like, he was like, yeah, I'm for peace. Whereas if he, if he went to the McKinsey group and, and got laundered through like whatever robot machine created mayor Pete as like, <laughs> A, a newly laundered born again, like war hero, you know, he didn't go through that. Right. He went through flack, right. Uh, at, at whatever thousand feet. Right. It's, well, yeah, super, super fascinating. Yeah. Go yeah ahead. Well, Danny, it, it, again, it makes me think of, of Dwight D Eisenhower. I mean, only, only Eisenhower could get up and make the speech that he made in 1961 about the military industrial complex. I mean, Eisenhower today would, would be dismissed by the Democrats as a leftist. Uh, I, I know that sounds absurd, but what uh, did, did any Democrat, other than probably Tulsi Gabbard, uh, did any Democrat have the balls of somebody like Dwight Eisenhower to warn us about the dangers of the military industrial complex? And then, of course, you know, there's that famous speech uh, b before then, I think it was 1953, where Eisenhower, the cross of iron speech, you know, where he talks about the, you know, every, every bomber is, you know, 10 high schools and, and every ship is, is five factories, you know, whatever examples he used. Is there, a, you know, this is, this is no way of life. There's this constant building of weapons. You know, this is, if we, if we keep up this militarism, you know, it'll be humanity hanging on a cross of iron. It's like, again, this is, this is a Republican saying this. Uh, no Democrat nowadays says anything like that, 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 that I'm aware of, uh, which is why you know, the only one who came close was Tulsi Gabbard, who he ran as, a, as a, you know, somewhat anti-war. She was definitely against regime change wars, as she, as she put it. And, and for doing that, of course, she was smeared as, as, a, as a Russian asset by NBC and by Hillary Clinton, who basically said, yeah, you know, the Russians have their, their name on a candidate, but, 
But uh, I won't say that candidate's name, Tulsi Gabbard. And and that's interesting. I mean, that's that's uh, that's the cost now. It's uh, you know, she was basically essentially because she's still in the military, right? I mean, yes. she's still a, so that I mean, she was accused of treason essentially. Yes. I mean, that yes. is li- if there are if there are libel laws, if they're supposed to even exist, right? If to the extent that you think they're valuable, like wow, that I mean, it's unbelievable. But uh, I've told people who've really screamed about this that, yes, we should scream about it. But uh, as I used to teach in my civil rights class, I'd say, you know, it has always been thus uh, when you speak out of turn to this sort of powerful war state and, uh, you know, and also just kind of like hyper powerful domestically forces, then they will always historically and conceptually and almost necessarily uh, identify you as somehow less than American, right? You somehow oh, I, have uh, attachments elsewhere. Yeah, why wouldn't they? Because I, I, I can't even conceive of it, Danny. Who can? But you know, who can conceive of a def- so-called defense budget? <laughs> um, you know, a war budget that each year uh, is somewhere around a trillion dollars. You know, when when you add it all up, when you add up the cost of the wars, the Defense Department, the Pentagon budget, the you know, Homeland Security, nuclear weapons as part of the Energy Department and, you know, the VA and everything else. Uh, I mean, it's it's such a vast sum of money. Uh, and everyone wants of that. You know, a good friend of mine, you know, he does he does work in the, in the Beltway area. And he's and he's he was telling me he's there. You know, I've been to I've been to Crystal City. Uh, you know, I've been to some of these defense contractors like defense contractors like Lockheed Martin. He said, when you walk into their headquarters buildings in Crystal City and the Beltway, he said, it's like walking into a five-star hotel. I mean, these things, these places are posh. You know, you can just feel the money. Uh, and if, if, if you and I or other people are like, hey, you know, we need to cut the defense budget. We need to, we need to tackle this. We, we, we need to change this. Of course, we're going to get pushed back. I mean, there are people making fortunes off of all this. Um, you know, just, just as a random thought, I, I remember reading in the 1930s that, of course, this is Smedley Butler time, but where, you know, service members, you know, World War I veterans were, were fighting back then. They said, we're only, going to get, we're only going to get this under control if we get the profit out of war. And it's like, you know, this is stuff written in the 1930s. And it's like, now look where we are now. Uh, you know, at least we had the Nye Commission and the idea that, you know, that 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 being a wharf profiteer was not a good thing. And we were we were deploring all these European companies like uh, Vickers and 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 all the rest, you know, or Krupp in Germany is saying that th- these were the war profiteers and and we're not like that. And now we're the number we're we're the world's number one weapons. Uh, manufacturer uh, and distributor. I mean, it, it's 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 really our big business is 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 selling weapons around the world. We're number one, right? USA, USA. We're yep. number one. Um, well, uh, uh, God, man, I we could. Well, well, we're definitely going to have you back, Bill. Uh, and maybe we, we probably need to do just uh, an episode that, you know, kind of starts with uh, starts with George McGovern. And then we'll just cover all like the 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 lost cause candidates in history. You know, I feel like we can <laughs> geek out together on that. But um, I, I'm going to uh, be hopping off to hammer some of these very same points that we're, you're just bringing up with, with Smedley Butler and with some of this. Uh, you know, insider training and cor- or, or trading and corruption on on the, their roller decks, which is really what they're hiring a lot of these guys for, oh, right? Sure. You know, uh, I'm going to go hammer some of that with with Max Blumenthal here in right. a bit, and uh, I mean, I feel like we can yell about this forever, and and in one sense, uh, as I said at uh, his graveside, uh, Smedley Butler in Westchester. Pennsylvania I was speaking there on the 19th I believe it was it was like the 19th anniversary or maybe it was October 18th and it was the 19th anniversary of the Rangers hitting the ground I believe and uh, we were like you know not celebrating that right we were just saying how obscene this is and we chose his gravesite. and uh, I had said in my little talk about him I said you know I didn't mention EMN purposely just because of the nature of the event but uh, you know we we 
purposely obviously picked Eisenhower, right, because of the fact that he, you know, was a Republican, even though today he wouldn't be, um, and that he was a general who spoke out against this stuff. And it's it's powerful. It's powerful. And, and I think the Cross of Iron speech is, is as, or at least, you know, sort of linguistically more powerful, right, in terms of rhetoric. But right. Smedley Butler kind of laid out a lot of the contours to what later gets described by Ike as the military industrial complex, like, 30 years before that, you know, and it's just, it's super interesting. But uh, so anyway, that's my kind of like plug on, on EMN and, uh, and, and Henry's going to ask just a little bit about that as we kind of roll out. And I think it's, you know, he's got some thoughts on it and okay. uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on, uh, yeah, just on the general concept of, you know, Ike, the Mick and what vets can do in these situations. Sure. Um. So, Bill, yeah, we just want to, you know, I, I, it's, it's a, you know, the EMN, it's, it's very new. Um, still not even entirely sure what all it, it can possibly grow into as time goes on. But um, I'm curious to hear, you know, what's your, uh, you know, why was it interesting to you? Um, what kind of areas do you think it'll be um, critically important to change the, the discussion a bit? Any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Well, I remember, I remember writing a piece uh, for uh, Neiman Watchdog. It was uh, a, a journalism site, uh, and and basically, I said that in in my in my article, I said is that the media, the networks need to need to replace uh, the Pentagon cheerleaders on television, uh, on the networks, with with real journalists who know something about uh, the military. Uh, and and I think uh, that you know that's that's something that I think we need to work towards because when when we see when we watch uh, you know networks with MSNBC or whatever uh, you know you see a lot of the usual suspects you see retired generals appear uh, and these retired generals are are you know talking about the Iraq War or they're talking about Afghanistan or terrorism or whatever. And oftentimes it's someone like General McCaffrey or, and oftentimes they, they, uh, they, they still have ties to uh, weapons manufacturers uh, and they're generally offering you Pentagon talking points. And so that's what people are hearing. They're, they're turning on the news. They're seeing a retired colonel or retired general uh, and, and to the, to the normal view, it might be like, oh, well, that's reasonable. I, th- there's a retired general talking about this. He, he must know what he's talking about. I'm sure he's giving me a somewhat fair and unbiased opinion. Uh, and, and that simply isn't the case. Uh, we, we really need to create a, a sort of, of, which is exactly what we're up to in, in EMN, you know, a, an alternative to this sort of pro-war a pro weapons, pro high defense spending, all of that. We we need to create an alternative view. And what I like about EMN is 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 that it has a range of of voices that that appealed to me. And what I mean by a range is you know it's not just not just generals and colonels, but but okay, you got a major, you got a captain, you know you've you got some enlisted people. Uh, that's the way it should be. We need to hear from you know, the sergeants uh, or the privates or, uh, you know, it's just as much as we need to hear from, you know, the colonels and, and the generals. In fact, we need to hear from, you know, companies, commanders and platoon sergeants even more so uh, because they're the ones at the at the tip of the spear, as we say. They're the ones who really know what's going on on the ground. Uh, and so I'm really, I'm encouraged that EMN has that kind of, of of, of, you know, diversity within, uh, whereas, you know, most, mostly what you see on, you know, television and, you know, mainstream media, it's, it's just the usual, you know, retired colonels and retired generals, you know, well-connected within the beltway, uh, uh, you know, kind of in many, in many cases, basically spouting talking points given to them by the Pentagon. That it, yeah, it has. There, there is no variance between the Pentagon's position and anybody else. It's the 
the big five-sided building has said, this is what we're going to do. So this is what we're going to do. And I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to see what EMN can do on, on the, on overall in the, in the conversation. But I think that it's going to be even more fun seeing media types have to deal with some of those interviews, having to really be asked hard questions that haven't probably ever been asked to them or point out things that they themselves didn't know as often happens to me on the podcast because my, my, uh, range of knowledge is much, uh, much smaller compared to, to Danny's or even yourself. A lot of other people we have on the podcast. Um, Bill, um, before we close out here today, I was wondering if you could let the listeners know where they can follow your work and uh, what you have coming up in the future. All right. Well, uh, I, I have a personal blog, which is uh, Bracing Views. So if, if they're interested in following my work, they can, they can go to uh, Bracing Views, my, my site. And I write about uh, a lot of military topics there, but, but I also occasionally go into other things uh you know because you know writing about the military all the time uh believe it or not it, it can get a it can get a little tiring yeah uh, it, so, can, it um, can be quite bleak I, yeah and I, I i also i also write quite a bit for uh for for tom dispatch uh and tom dispatch probably some of you already are familiar with that but that's a great site uh carrying a range of views uh uh and in fact in talking with tom Engelhart. Uh, he was one of the first, if not the first, you know, so-called liberal or leftist sites who actually invited military people to write for him. So people like uh, retired Colonel Andy Basevich, you know, myself and and Danny. So all credit to Tom Dispatch for for connecting people with dissenting military uh, views. So. Uh, yeah, so that's where uh, Bracing Views is my main site, and hopefully uh, people will, will come and find some articles that they that they enjoy reading. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed everything I've, I've read there. It's, uh, it's, it's a great resource for people, and, and, and also that the, um, you know, we don't, uh, there aren't many too many dissenting voices from the Air Force overall that within you know, kind of the larger anti-war community. So having someone with your experience, having someone who was in the Air Force, but you were an engineer and you weren't a pilot, so your experience is very, very different than people like Danny or, or myself. So, well, Bill, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope that uh, I hope that we will talk with you again, which I'm sure you will. And uh, I think that I think that'll do it. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me. It was, uh, it was fun. And, you know, I, I will say that, uh, that, you know, talking it, it just in our small circle, the, the EMN circle, it's just encouraging to know sometimes that there are other, other veterans out there who also have uh, dissenting views or a lot of questions about and, and a lot of concerns about the path that we're on. There's strength in numbers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's kind of our unofficial motto here at, at Fortress on a Hill that we, we try to let people tell their stories and to understand the nuance that gets you to a position where you say that war cannot be a choice. It can't just be a, an, an action that we do without having to defend ourselves or redefine our values in some very, very significant way. Right. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bill. Talk to you soon. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify, you name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com and if you're not into giving us a monthly payment think about giving us a couple bucks on paypal the link is in the show notes skepticism is one's best armor never forget it we'll see you next time and listen to my song I